Compression is one of, I think, the most practical, helpful, expressive, and fun effects that you can use on a bass signal, or maybe any signal. Compression is incredibly versatile. I think it's often misunderstood and sometimes misused. So today, we're gonna to talk about some of my favorite ways to use compression on bass, and also maybe some of my least favorite ways to use compression on bass, and you can decide for yourself. So, here we go. Okay, so first up, what is compression? Well, we could talk about it from a technical standpoint, and we could talk about how it's something that's controlling the dynamic range, and we could talk about optical compressors and FET compressors and get really nerdy, but I don't think that's going to be as helpful or fun. Uh, skip ahead if you already understand compression, but I'm going to quickly explain a way to help me understand it a little better. So it's a silly story, but imagine that you are a kid and you have a stereo in your room and you turn up the volume and your mom comes and bangs on the door and tells you to turn the volume down. In this story, your mom is the compressor. Okay, so bear with me. There's a bunch of different controls on a lot of compressors and it can be a little confusing as to what they're actually doing. So in this example, the threshold is how loud you can turn up your stereo before your mom comes and bangs on the door. Threshold is at what point is the compressor gonna engage? How loud can something get before we start to squish that sound back down? The ratio, that's how much you're gonna actually turn the stereo down when your mom bangs on the door, right? You might turn it way down or you might just barely turn it down. That has to do with your ratio. Ratio is just a technical term to describe how much we're reducing that sound once it exceeds that threshold, right? So pretty straightforward so far. Then you have attack and release, what's that? So attack is how quickly your mom is gonna show up and bang on the door and you're gonna turn down the volume when you exceed that threshold, right? Is it immediate or is it take her a little bit of time to come bang on the door? And does it take you a little time to actually turn it down? That's your attack time. And then your release time is how quickly you're gonna turn your stereo back up once your mom leaves. So if you understand those four things, the threshold, the ratio, the attack, and the release, you can get some vastly different results with compression. You can change the way the notes are shaped in different ways. You can use it in a practical way or you can use it in a creative way. There's no rules, right? Compression is fun. And once you understand some of those fundamentals, you can start squishing sounds and getting some different results. There's other settings too that we're not gonna talk about in this video, like hard knee and soft knee, and there's some other stuff that you don't really need to worry about too much right now. Uh, and then some pedals don't even have all of those four. They might just have one knob, one compression knob, and that's fine too. There's different ways to use compression in different contexts, but I think understanding those main four settings is gonna really serve you well to start to use compression creatively. I see compressors used a few ways by bass players. I wanna talk about some of my favorite ways, but first I wanna talk about maybe my least favorite way to use compression and that's using compression as a crutch. And what I mean by that is using a compressor to clean up sloppy playing. Like if you have a pretty green bass player, new bass player, they're playing their notes and one note is super loud and the next note is half as loud and it's really inconsistent, it's really hard to get that to sound good in the context of a song. And I've run front of house and I'll tell you, if you have a bad bass player on stage, one of the first things that I would do is throw a compressor on their signal because it's really gonna help even out those notes and help squish some of those problem notes back down and make the bass sound just more consistent and sit in the mix. And this is really helpful. Like this is a good thing to do, I think, if it's necessary. But my challenge for you, the bass player, is to try and become your own compressor. Try and develop your feel and your hands and your fine motor skills to be able to play consistently without the assistance of a compressor. If front of house, or the mixing engineer wants to put a compressor on your signal, that's totally their call. I'm talking about for you, what you're sending to the mixing console, what you're sending to front of house. I would encourage you to not lean on compression to get your signal there sounding good. I think use compression in a more creative or technically intentional way rather than just cleaning up sloppy playing. 
So now that that's out of the way, let's talk about some ways I really do like to use compression. So one really successful way to use compression, in my opinion, is on stylistic performances where there's a lot of dynamic range. So for example, if you play slap bass, or if you play really intensely and aggressively with a pick, and maybe one part of the song is louder and one part of the song is softer, or one part of a groove is louder and one part of a groove is softer, what it can kind of do is it can take the really harsh, uh, intense, loud parts and just bring them down a little bit where it's not going to be as harsh. It's going to not make your amp work quite as hard. It's going to control your dynamic range in a way that's going to make the music just feel and fit a little better. Not because you're playing sloppily, just because there's a huge difference between the loud things and the soft things. So it's going to make the harsh things a little less harsh, but it's also going to bring up some of the nuance of the little things. So for example, if you're playing slap bass where you have like you're hitting your thumb and you're plucking these really loud things, but then your left hand, you're sort of hitting uh, the strings with your left hand. It's going to bring up some of the percussive nuances of some of those quieter things, and it's going to tame some of the really loud things, and it's going to kind of make the whole thing sound a little bit fatter and a little more consistent in a really pleasant, positive sort of way. So this slap bass thing, check it out. We can actually look at the waveforms. No compression. Compression. That's really interesting to me. You can actually see all of these peaks in the uncompressed section. That's when I'm hitting my thumb. And there are these spikes that are really loud in this uncompressed section here. But then when we get to the compressed section here, you can see how these transients are a lot more under control, but also a lot of these little things are a lot fatter, right? So what that's translating to is we're bringing the really harsh things down and we're kind of pulling out some of the details. And you'll hear when the compressor kicks on, you can actually see the compression and how it's affecting the waveform. Off. On. And it feels louder, even though it's not really louder. It's actually quieter in places, but overall, the sound is more consistent, makes it feel better, makes it feel fuller, makes it feel fatter. And I think it's just a really cool way to use compression in a practical way. I think it punched harder because the compression was on. So compression isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think some people, when they hear the word compression, they get reminded of like, how music got way too compressed in the early 2000s and how like compression can pull the life out of a performance those things can be the case i'm not saying that's not the case but i'm saying there's so many different ways to use compression and it can be used in a way like this where you're actually i think making the music more powerful not less powerful by intentionally taming it in a certain way it's allowing it to be even more aggressive and more cool i think that same sort of concept can also apply to less aggressive music where you're playing more finger style you can actually sort of do the same thing but bring up the really quiet things in the music so like if you're playing ghost notes or there's little slides or little sort of nuances in your playing that aren't super audible in a mix a compressor can kind of bring some of those moments to life where you can actually hear them better Interesting. So I think what's happening is those ghost notes are coming through more clearly and you can actually see it. If we look at this, the beginning is compressed. Notice how these notes are pretty consistent. So these little short ones here, 
or maybe here, this is, you can tell because there's no tail behind it. That is just the ghost note. But notice how its velocity is very similar to the notes that follow it. So basically we've enhanced and empowered this ghost note to power through as opposed to like here and here, look how much smaller this one is than this one. And it kind of disappears. Same here, this note here, that's a ghost note that's sort of disappearing in the music. But then when the compressor is on, back on here, those little nuance things, those are coming out more because the compressor is working. And I think it kind of is actually changing the way the groove feels a little bit because now those ghost notes in the bass are almost, since they have a little more authority, they're almost more like a feathered kick drum. Like, you know, drummers will like accent little 16th notes around the kick, the main kick pattern. It's kind of like that. So it's subtle. It's like a really small thing. It's not like a super audible thing. That's using compression to sort of unlock the potential of a detail in the music that you couldn't do without that compressor. Also, when you're playing fingerstyle and you're using a compressor, I think it can kind of be reminiscent of how a tube amp feels. You can use a compressor not just for how it's gonna shape the sound, but actually how it feels to play, right? I think one of the reasons people love playing tube amps is because of the natural compression that occurs in a tube amp. You're getting saturation, you're getting compression naturally from the tubes, right? So when you're playing solid state or you're playing direct, sometimes it can feel harsh but when you use a compressor, you can actually use it to sort of reintroduce some of the squishiness that might remind you of playing through a tube amp. So it's not so much about how it sounds, it's about how it feels. One way that I like to think of it is like, if you're running barefoot on sand at the beach, it feels totally different than running on asphalt with tennis shoes. Even though you might be going the same speed, the experience is very different for the runner, right? It's the same thing when you're using a tube amp or you're using solid state or you're direct in. The way the notes in the bass feel and interact with how it sounds are all very different. So you can use something like a compressor to reintroduce some of the nuance or squishiness or sponginess that you might be wanting to feel from something like a tube amp when you don't have access to one. So compression can be more of a feel thing, not just a sound thing. Another way I like to use compression is using a compressor to allow you to create a note that you could not make without a compressor. And by that, I mean the shape of the note. For example, you could set a relatively low threshold and a relatively high ratio and a relatively fast attack time and a slow release time. And what you could do is you could create a massive note that lasts like forever or almost forever. You can actually make an unnaturally sustained note that can be really helpful. Like think about like we're at the top of a big chorus and you come in and you play this massive note that just does not decay. It just keeps going almost like a synth, right? You can accomplish a sound like that using a compressor where you could not get that sound without using some sort of effect like a compressor. I think that's cool. I think using that to your advantage musically is really expressive. This is an example of creative compression where you're using a compressor to accomplish a note that you could not get without a compressor. You can also use this to your advantage by cutting off the notes. You can start with a huge note and then cut it off abruptly and it can be a really dramatic sort of sounding line. It's almost like we're turning the water pressure up on the sound. The note has so much sustain, these notes almost last forever, which is not something that you can naturally do with an electric bass without the help of something like a compressor. It reminds me of like when you're driving in the rain and all of a sudden you go underneath an overpass and the rain just totally shuts off. Like the sound disappears and then when you drive back out into the ring, you hear it again. And it's this sort of jarring thing where you have this like,
constant steady noise that all of a sudden is drastically stopped. And when you have a compression setting like this, it's like we're making these notes massive and then I can sort of accentuate that by stopping them abruptly with the muting. So, and I can dig in, I'm playing this pretty hard and it's like, it's a big note and then off, off. For example, let's just say I played one note without the compressor. versus with the compressor. Still going. I might throw the waveform up on there too because it's not just how long it goes, but it's like the shape of the note is so much different. Look at these waveforms. So the first note here is an uncompressed note and the second one is compressed. Let's listen to them. I mean, that P bass does have a lot of sustain. You can really hear that compressor opening up and actually I think you can see it here. I think this little dip and then when it flattens out, I think that's the attack time from here to here and then the release time, it starts to lose steam here. But you can see how drastically this note has been shaped and how much sustain we're getting. But when you play it with short notes, this is the compressed signal playing that line Then this is the uncompressed signal. Notice how much louder it is because I'm playing really hard. It's really squished. What that's allowing me to do is dig in with that pick and play really hard, but it's controlling it and fattening it and it's a totally different sort of sound. You can see how thick and full those notes are and how they're not disappearing or fading away. They're just like a wall of bass energy that's on and then it's off. And it kind of creates this cool vibe like in context. So this is an example of using compression not as a crutch, but as a tool, right? You want to lean into using compression in a way that's empowering you to unlock your musical potential to get you a sound that you couldn't get without a compressor not just using a compressor to just cover up or smooth over sloppy playing the examples that i showed you i didn't really come up with those parts until i had the compressor on right i think the point is if you're going to use a compressor lean into it let it inspire you I think it's way more fun that way. I think it's way more creative and you're gonna come up with stuff that you didn't expect. I should say too, with great power comes great responsibility. You do need to be careful with how you're compressing things and you also wanna be respectful of your engineers, right? Your recording engineer or your front of house engineer because once you squish something and you send them something that's been compressed, they can't uncompress it, right? So you do wanna be courteous with how you're using these concepts. It all has to do with context but you don't have to be afraid of it. Oh, and by the way, my name is Philip Conrad. I'm so happy to be a guest on the Stringjoy channel. Thank you, Stringjoy, for having me. I have a YouTube channel of my own if you wanna check that out, Philip Conrad Music. Thank you to you for watching this video and thank you to Stringjoy for having me. And Hopefully, I'll see you on another video soon. Thanks.